Do people hear me? Do people hear me? So, um, um, it's a great honor to be awarded this prize, especially with Svante Papo, who um, uh, um, is a um, longtime collaborator and a great hero of mine. I um, was asked when I present, prepared this talk to talk not only about my science, but a little bit of personal reflection. So I'm going to begin the talk with a little bit of personal reflection just briefly and end the talk again that way. So I'm going to end, begin the talk in the first part with a little bit of personal reflection about the ancient DNA revolution in which I've been privileged to be a part. And then in the main body of the talk, which is scientific, I'm going to talk about the genetic formation of West Eurasia and what we've begin, begun to learn about the genomic transformations that have happened over the last 40,000 years in modern humans um, in the Western part of Eurasia. And I'm going to and a little bit by talking about opportunities for ancient DNA research in Israel, but mostly I'm going to really talk a little bit, of, give a little bit of personal reflection. So I think my big scientific break came in 2007 when Svante Pebo invited me and my long-term scientific collaborator, Nick Patterson, to join the group that was going to analyze the Neanderthal genome sequences that were being produced in Leipzig in Germany. So it was very clear to Nick Patterson, who's a statistician and myself, that this was the best data in the world in any field, and we wanted to do anything we could to be part of analyzing it. And so over the next eight years or five years in a series of papers, I personally made many, many, many trips, several a year to Leipzig uh, to work with the colleagues there, and really thought of this for me as a chance to do a second postdoctoral stint, another period of being a postdoc working with a mentor um, on uh, analyzing this amazing data that was being produced in Leipzig. And so this was a project where as normally as a lab, someone running a laboratory, I would work, uh, supervise students. For this project, I worked on the, the data myself and did a lot of analysis myself alongside Nick Patterson, uh, my colleague. Um, what happened then in 2011 was that I was part of a faculty search committee in my university where we were looking for, a, it was a general genetic search for a junior person um, in 2011 in the human evolutionary department, in biology department in my university. And we got the most amazing applicants in the world for this position. The best people really in ancient DNA and other areas were applied for this position in our, in our university. And the search committee decided, even though we got these amazing candidates, that ancient DNA was not a promising direction for learning about human evolutionary biology. And I've, I was convinced it was, um, based on my experience being part of the Neanderthal Consortium. I found, thought that it was important not just for understanding human population transformations, but for understanding human biology. And I found it a very frustrating situation because it was clear that this type of research would not happen at my university. And so as a result, I dropped everything I was doing or nearly everything I was doing and I retooled my entire laboratory which was focusing mostly on medical genetics and where we had the side hobby of studying human population history and retooled it to try to work on human ancient DNA. Um, we were helped in this by Svante Pebo who supported us. Um, Svante was focused on a laser, like a laser beam on archaic genomics and um, was very supportive of what we wanted to do, but I thought that there was a great opportunity of applying this technology to later periods to earn understanding how populations got to be how they are today. And as a result, I, um, he, he helped us to, to set up this laboratory, and uh, Nadine Rowland, who was, uh, had spent seven years uh, in Svante's laboratory in the Le Leipzig Institute, uh, became lab director in our laboratory, and we, 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 we built this laboratory. Um, and what we focused on in our laboratory was the idea of not just studying a small number of incredibly important samples, but studying large numbers of modern samples. And we really tried to make ancient DNA genomic and to do it on a large scale because we felt there were things to be able to, to be learned by analyzing large numbers of samples, producing genome-wide data on them, and being able to study population transformations. So I think the old paradigm that I think is a very important one was to search for a golden sample. Most of the Neanderthals and other archaic genomes that one sequences doesn't, don't work. 
And so after much screening, one perhaps finds one such sample and then works very, very hard on it. And that's a very important paradigm. But the paradigm that we were work planning to work on was to study samples over the last 10,000 years, for the most part, that would work much better than this. And many, a large fraction of them would work. And we would do as much as we could to increase the probability that any one sample screened would work. And we also wanted to implement techniques that would produce data that was actually cost effective in our laboratory. We didn't have a, a very large budget. We had a substantial budget, but not a very large budget to do this work. And so we wanted to drive the price per sample for screening under $500. It's well under that now um, to produce genome-wide data. Um, ancient DNA, as Svante explained, is expensive so, because so little of it is human. Um, and even when one does get human DNA, often the parts of DNA one gets are not informative about population history. And so the solution we set on was one that was again developed in Leipzig by Matthias Meyer and Xiaomei Fu. Um, of enriching the genomic material that we got from these libraries, from the, the, the material extracted from the samples for the positions that we cared about. Not only for human positions, but from human positions at positions, human data at positions where we already had a lot of data from present day people. And so what we ended up doing is enriching the DNA that was obtained from the samples for this subset of positions in the genome that were human, and it results in a hundred or a thousand fold enrichment. And as a result, when one does one sequencing, one really only needs to put in a hundred dollars of sequencing and obtains genome wide data for these samples. We enrich for about a million positions in the genome, and we have now uh, a large number of samples um, where we have data from these positions. And we're producing in our laboratory more than a thousand working samples per year in the laboratory. I want to make a comparison to Moore's law, which is not a result from, not, not, a, not a pattern in, in biology, but a patter, pattern from the computer science field, which refers to the fact that over the last hundred years, the number of elements on circuits has doubled every one to two years, and this is an important driving force in driving the computer revolution. But in DNA, the increase has been much faster than that. In 2010, when the first genome-wide data was produced, there were only a few samples. Uh, there was a trickle. Uh, over the next few years, and then suddenly in 2014, there were a couple of dozen samples, and then sometimes it went into, when some, some, suddenly in 2015, it went into hyperdrive. Um, and right now, for example, in our laboratory, we just hit almost 2,700 working samples just produced in our own laboratory, and I'm sure large numbers of samples are also being produced in other laboratories. And this makes it possible to study how populations change over time, comparing our, uh, ancient skeletons to each other and uh, present-day people to understand how these transformations occur. The paradigm that we're using, this enrichment technology, has several features that I wanted to um, highlight for you. It produces data that, from the point of view of studying population history, is just as important, is just as powerful as the whole genome sequencing data, but it is much cheaper. Um, and so if you look at the cost in dollars per, per per sequence that one produces. In a recent very impressive study published in 2015, maybe $8,000 per each of the, hun of, of the, in sequencing for each of the approximately 100 sequences. If you look at the type of data that's produced by this technology, the cost is about 40 times lower, and the amount of data at the positions one actually analyzes is about four times higher. So in the second part of my talk, I wanted to talk about scientific output and the results of applying this type of analysis to looking at human history. And I'm going to talk in particular about where most of the data has been from, not because this is a more important part of the world than other parts, although it is an important part of the world, but just because that's where much of the data are from right now. And I want to begin by talking about Luca Cavalli Sforza, who is another hero of mine. Um, and he's the found, I think of him as the founder of whole genome studies of the past. Um, and in 1960, he made a bet that it would be possible to reconstruct the deep history of humans based on present day populations. And this bet has completely failed. And it was a reasonable bet at the time. So the idea was that if you go back 500 years before transoceanic travel, the population structure of the world would be not very disrupted and might reflect the people who arrived in each place in the world. Um, when modern humans first got there, that the world might have been peopled in a serial founder event where individuals coming out of Africa sometime after 100,000 years ago reached the Near East, and the present day populations of the Near East might descend without much further mixture from those groups. Those groups would then butt off additional populations which would people each place of India and Southeast Asia, Australia, the Americas, 
each place butting off additional groups, and the groups that are there today would descend from those ancestral groups. So that by studying the diversity of the present day groups and the relationships amongst them, one could understand the history of these populations. And this has driven a lot of work. But every important claim that Cavalli Sforza made that was going well beyond the archaeology and the linguistics that was based on the genetic data has since been falsified. And the reason is because populations have mixed tremendously and they've moved around. People are very mobile. And we now see that with ancient DNA. And I'm going to tell you the evidence for this in West Eurasia. And I actually think of Luca Cavalli Sforza, Sforza as much like the biblical character of Moses, who really saw what would be possible um, and really laid, had a vision for what would be possible um, in this field. But Really, his career ended um, before uh, being able to cross into the promised land. And he, hasn't re he didn't really have access to the type of data that one really needs to be, have to be able to see, uh, figure out what happened, which is ancient DNA. So the first chapter in this tale I'm going to try to tell you about the genomic formation of West Eurasia is about Ice Age Europe. And I'm going to tell you about a paper that we worked on in collaboration with Svante Pebo and others, with uh, Xiaomei Fu, who is a graduate student or a po uh, early postdoc in Svante's lab when she started this work and finished it in my laboratory. And in this study, we put together genome-wide data from 51 ancient humans who lived between 45,000 years ago and 7,000 years ago, mostly hunter-gatherers, mostly from Europe, which is where a lot of the best data still comes from. These samples had the distribution shown in the map and the age distribution shown in the map by the heights of the bars. One of the things that we first saw in the data, and Svante actually talked about one of these individuals already, was how Neanderthal ancestry, we could estimate the proportion of Neanderthal ancestry in each of these 51 individuals over time. Uh, here I show the subset of these individuals who have enough data to make a good estimate. And what we see is that over time, there is a decrease in the proportion of Neanderthal ancestry. There's this very anomalous individual, Owasa, who has a and who has a, Neanderthal, uh, has a Neanderthal four to six generations back in their family tree. But for me, what's equally interesting is the decline in Neanderthal ancestry over time in all the rest of the individuals. And it's very clear from multiple lines of evidence that this is not because of dilution of the population by populations that didn't have Neanderthal ancestry, but rather it's because there's been natural selection to remove Neanderthal ancestry from the population over time um, because it's broadly toxic to the genome, and except in specific places like some of those that Svante has referred to where it's been advantageous. But broadly, Neanderthal ancestry was not advantageous in the individuals who carries it, carried it. It still is not, on average, very advantageous, showing, explaining why the proportion is to, continuing to decline. So in these 51 ancient humans, we clustered them in this heat map based on their proximity, their genetic similarity to each other. And we found that they clustered broadly with time into clusters of similarities shown by these bright light squares of individual, of samples that are genetically broadly similar to each other. And they correspond um, quite strongly, but not perfectly, to archaeological cultures, archaeologically defined stone tool cultures. Uh, one of these cultures, which we name here by the first individual in the series of our data that had high quality data, uh, we call the Vestanites cluster, uh, after the site of uh, uh, Dolne Vestanitsa or in uh, the Czech Republic. And it corresponds very strongly to the Gravedian culture from about 33,000 to 25,000 years ago. All these individuals are in this culture from all parts of uh, Europe. Uh, there's another close cluster beginning about 19,000 years ago and continuing until 14,000 years ago that we call the El Miron cluster, which that's from Western Europe broadly and Central Europe and corresponds strongly to the Magdalenian culture, which is a post-Ice Age culture. So there's a glacial maximum uh, until about 18,000 years ago and from 25,000 years ago. And these are the people archaeologically or the culture that archaeologically is associated with the repeopling of Europe from the southwest, uh, from, from Iberia. And then the last cluster, which includes the hunter-gatherers who farmers encountered beginning 8,500 years ago when they expanded into the region is what we call the Villabruna cluster. It's the Epipaleolithic and Mesolithic and, and um, Azelian group. Um, and, um, and this is genetically quite distinct again. We were able to make a tree of the sort that Svante showed um, of how these groups broadly relate to each other. These are each sample has a little bit of a different history, but this is a tree that seems to work for a number of individuals in each group. 
And so we have a tree where you have, for example, African modern humans here as being an early split, early Upper Paleolithic, early initial Upper Paleolithic uh, modern humans. This is a Siberian individual from 45,000 years ago, which represents a first split in this tree. And then we have uh, several early uh, Europeans and uh, Eastern Eurasian individuals. Um, we have an individual from Eastern Europe, which is uh, from Russia, from the Kostenki site, another from Belgium. Um, and these are, this individual is associated with the Aurignacian culture. The Gravettian culture seems to have very little ancestry from the Aurignacian group and is rather broadly seems to be consistent with replacement from the East from groups related to the Kostanki group who uh, spread all over, including to the West. The Magdalenian culture seems to Im involve a resurgence of this Aurignacian type lineage, which does not seem to have disappeared, but rather to have hidden out in pockets, presumably somewhere in Western Europe before resurfacing in mixed form in Iberia and then spreading back. And then there's this Epipaleolithic group, which is uh, from a different um, mix of ancestry yet again. Another thing that we see is that after 14,000 years ago, beginning with this Villabruna cluster, this Epipaleolithic group, the one that the farmers encountered beginning around 8,500 years ago when they arrived in, Euro in, in Europe, is that suddenly, if you look at the evidence of proximity of these um, hunter-gatherer samples to present-day people in the Near East, they're not particularly close to the Near East, as you would show by a, a deviation down on this plot, until about 14,000 years ago, when suddenly they seem to have a lot of genetic similarity um, to the Near East. And what this is reflecting, we think, is a coming together of the populations of the, uh, of the ancestors of Near Easterners and the ancestors, ancestors of uh, hunter-gatherers in Europe beginning around 14,000 years ago. This is the period of the first strong warming after the light, last ice age. It's the period when the wall of glacial ice um, that separated Western and Eastern Europe uh, finally broke. Um, and animals start being exchanged between Western and Eastern Europe. And perhaps what you have is evidence of a southeastern uh, refugee population from the Ice Age, repeopling, um, uh, perhaps from Greece or perhaps from Asia Minor, repeopling and spreading both into Europe and also into um, the Near East and bringing these two populations together well before that happened again with farming. So the summary from this first part of major features of European hunter-gatherer history revealed by DNA is that there's initial pioneer populations like this Owasa individual that Svante talked about that don't contribute much to later Europeans. There's a single founding population beginning around at least 37,000 years ago. We have data from it and continuing until we, about 14,000 years ago. This Gravedian or Vesta Knights lineage overspreads Europe over this period and replaces a lot of these previous lineages, although they exist in pockets before. There's a resurfacing of the origination related lineage from the West, beginning in, from the Southwest. Um, and then the populations begin to draw together beginning about 14,000 years ago, um, before, even before the arrival of farming, something that we still don't understand from ancient DNA because we don't have hunter-gatherers from this period from Southeastern Europe or from Asia Minor. So in chapter two of this part, I wanted to talk about the genomic impact of the Neolithic Revolution, the development of farming, which happens in this part of the world beginning around 11,000 years ago and spreads from there and has a very dramatic effect in all the places it spreads to in terms of the culture that people practice. Last year, we published a paper which published the first ancient DNA from the ancient Near East. We published 44 samples with genome-wide data and um, we added it to the existing literature. This was made possible by a new advance that we were working closely on this study with uh, Ron Pinhasi um, in Dublin, in Ireland, um, where DNA uh, it was, uh, part of, was one of several people who showed that DNA extracted from the cochlea of the petrous bone can produce yields that are sometimes 100 times greater than that of the other parts of the gene, uh, other, other bones and teeth. This was a breakthrough because combined with the enrichment, it meant that we could get DNA from places that have warm uh, conditions or difficult conditions which made otherwise DNA po uh, very difficult before and made ob obtaining DNA from places like the Near East something that we could hope to do regularly as opposed to have a lot of difficulty with this. It's still difficult, but we now are able to have a lot of success. So what we did in this study is we uh, carried out uh, analysis of about uh, almost 300 individuals, uh, ancient individuals that we had in 2016 um, and that we were able to analyze in this study. And just to unpack this a little bit, 
um, I will show you uh, principal components analysis. What we do is we take about 600,000 positions in the genome where people are variable. Some people have one type of, D of D DNA, like a, one letter, like a cytosine, a C. <laughs> Some people have another, like an adenine, an A. And so what you should think of is the data is a matrix of about 600,000 rows um, corresponding to all these positions and about uh, a thousand columns corresponding to each of the individuals we're analyzing. And the individuals we're analyzing are the ones shown in gray in this plot. These are the modern present-day West Eurasians from Europe and the Near East. And what you see when you analyze populations like that is that there are um, uh, two uh, gradients of populations. One is these uh, Europeans, people from mainland Europe, who fall in this gradient over here, and the other is Near Easterners who form in, fall in this gradient over here, and they have a gap in between where there's relatively few populations, and we think this reflects um, the mixture of hunter-gatherers uh, and Near Easterners that re is present in present-day Europeans. I'll talk about that a little bit more shortly. Um, I am um, going to skip this in interests of time. Um, but what we see in this data is that um, 10,000 years ago, the level of population differentiation in West Eurasia was comparable to that in East, in East Europeans and East Asians. So if you look at populations from the eastern part of Europe, uh, from, um, uh, from Iran, uh, from uh, pre-pottery farmers and hunter-gatherers like Natufians, from uh, the, the, this part of the world, and also from Anatolia and first farmers of Europe, these groups genetically were all as different from each other as Europeans and East Asians are today. But today, West Eurasia is much of a muchness genetically. People are very similar to each other all the way from Britain to Iran and to Central Asia. And so how did this transformation happen? So what you can actually see in our ancient DNA is actually what happens and when it happens. So 10,000 years ago, the level of differentiation is unmeasured on this scale around 0.098 or around 0.1, about the same as between Europeans and East Asians. And then in the uh, Copper Age and in the uh, f early farming period, and then in the Bronze Age, it drops dramatically until by the Bronze Age, the level of differentiation across West Eurasia is similar to what it, you see today. And what happened is the following. It's not that some of these groups disappeared, it's that they all expanded and mixed into each other. And so if you look at these ancient poles of West Eurasian variation, all four of them, all four of which have contributed to substantially, substantially to people today, what you could think of the group that is typical of the Iranian early farmers about 10,000 years ago, the group that is typical for the farmers around here, the pre-pottery farmers from 10,000 years ago, European hunter-gatherers, the Epipaleolithic group that I told you about before, and Eastern European hunter-gatherers who I haven't told you much about. These are all highly differentiated populations represented by different colors on this plot. The later populations are mixtures of them, and the reason there's low levels of differentiation is because they mixed with each other. And so what you actually see in West Eurasia is that there's an expansion of all these groups in all directions. They mix with each other and collapse the high level of differentiation that was observed today. And I think this is a very powerful finding because I think that when people think of the West Eurasians today, often, for example, People think of genetically homogeneous groups which have been intact genetically for tens of thousands of years. People have a picture in their head of a racial structure of the world which has been intact for tens of thousands of years. And in fact, if you went back 10,000 years ago, populations would be just as different as they are today from each other, indeed more in some ways, but the structure would not be one you would recognize. It would be very different with whole large groups that would exist at that time, not corresponding to the picture people have in, what, in their heads of the nature of relationships amongst groups. So I think this makes it very clear, the ancient DNA, that the population structure of today is very different from that of the past and arises through mixture, which has been quite profound and repeated over time and is not just a phenomenon of the last 500 years. Say that? So the, the question is, where is Israel in the story? And I think the answer is that it's not, we don't have much data from there yet. And I think that uh, that is a work in progress. And, but it's already clear that uh, uh, in our data from Israel over time, there is evidence of uh, exactly this mixture process where the first farmers are, uh, who are typical Levantine early farmer ancestry then have a major input of Iranian-related ancestry over time. And understanding how present-day people relate to this is a different question. But I'm going to talk about the next part of this talk now. So 
Um, the third part I wanted to tell you about was the evidence of the transformation of Europe itself after the arrival of farming beginning 8,500 years ago. There's profound evidence of major cultural change uh, from archaeology and linguistics. Beginning 8,500 years ago, farmers arrive um, in a beachhead in Greece from probably Anatolia, and they spread from there to the far reaches of Europe by around 6,000 years ago um, to Sweden and to Britain, for example. Um, also, the languages of Europe are genetically homogeneous today, with a few exceptions, um, and that seems to reflect perhaps movements of culture and suggests the possibility that there might be movements of people related to that. Ancient DNA work over the last 10 years, including the early mitochondrial DNA work, showed that the advent of farming was accompanied by mass movements of people from the Near East, where Genetically, the first farmers of Europe were very different from the hunter-gatherers and genetically more similar to those of the people of the Near East today, for example, because there was no ancient DNA from Near Easterners at the time. And people had in mind that people in Europe today might be a mixture of two ancestral populations, farmers and hunter-gatherers in different proportions in different parts of Europe. In 2012, though, we were analyzing modern DNA and we found a really odd result, which is that Northern European people today, for example, French people, um, but also German people and also British people and um, Polish people and so on, are in fact, um, genetically, the frequencies of positions in the genome are intermediate between Southern Europeans, especially isolated groups like Sardinians, and of all people, Native Americans. And Native Americans, more than East Asians and more than Central Asians and more than Southeast Asians, and the way we carried out this test, the only possible explanation for this was that Europeans are mixed of two groups, at least, which are related distantly, not closely, but distantly to, on the one hand, Southern Europeans, and the other hand, Native Americans. And Native Americans don't have any obvious relationship to early European hunter-gatherers, and so we were struggling to reconcile this with the finding of hunter-gatherer-farmer mixture model for Europeans. What we proposed is that Europeans, Northern Europeans today, are a mixture of an ancient Levantine population, um, first, first farmers of the Levant who came through, or of Anatolia who came into Europe, and a group that we called ancient North Eurasians, a population that no longer exists, but that once was in Northern Eurasia and more than 15,000 years ago contributed to the population that spread into the Americas, and it also contributed somehow to Europeans today. So we proposed this, and it was what at the time we called a ghost population, a population that we predicted statistically, but that did not exist today, and it was just a statistical construct. But uh, uh, the next year, another group working in Denmark found this ghost population. They found it in Lake Baikal region of Siberia. They got DNA from a 24,000-year-old individual, and this individual met this prediction. It was an even better proxy for this ancestral population than our Native Americans. And it was clear that this really did happen. And we developed a uh, working model for how this population, as well as hunter-gatherers and farmers, contributed to Europeans today. So here, again, is the West Eurasian principal component analysis, which shows genetically how populations are most similar to each other. Europeans splay out on this gradient with a pretty big gap in between them to the Near East. I'm now going to gray out these spots um, to show where the, oops, sorry. Um, so a model of history consistent with the data is that there's an early split of Africans from all non-African populations associated with the migration out of Africa. East Asians then branch, and then there's a group that splits and is ancestral on the one hand to these ancient North Eurasians, and on the other hand to these um, European uh, uh, hunter-gatherers. Um, Native Americans are a mixture of these ancient North Eurasians and a group related to East Asians. Um, Early European farmers are a deep branch, uh, a mixture of a deep branch and another branch related to European hunter-gatherers, and Europeans today are a mixture of these three sources, ancient North Eurasians, European hunter-gatherers, and farmers, in different proportions. So what this is, was very interesting was that the ancient DNA from 5,000, 6,000, 7,000 years ago was showing all mixtures of early hunter-gatherers and farmers and none of this later ancient North Eurasian ancestry, but we now know it suffuses Europe. It's all over Europe. So what happened? So we had evidence from mitochondrial DNA from 2013 that this new ancestry, um, uh, a new type of ancestry arrived beginning about 4,500 years ago in Central Europe. And so we decided to look at this with genome-wide data. And so here's this map again, uh, this picture again of how population samples are related to each other. Um, and here's Europe and the Near East now in gray. And I'll show you how the ancient samples look over time. So first come the European hunter-gatherers. They fall beyond Europe in the, 
in the direction of European differentiation from the Near East. Europe is a mixture of these hunter-gatherers and these farmers. Then there is a early farmers appear beginning 80, 8,500 years ago in Europe. There's then a mixture between those hunter-gatherers and the farmers. In Eastern Europe, meanwhile, another population forms that's a mixture of Eastern European hunter-gatherers and a Northern Near Eastern population, but populations like those of Europe today don't yet exist 5,000 years ago. Then suddenly, 4,500 years ago, you see populations like those of Europe today. And this is an association with a group called the Corded Ware, or a culture called the Corded Ware, which um, has affinities to the East, to the steppe. And just here's another summary of the data. The Near Eastern farmers come in beginning 8,500 years ago. This is this orange bar, and all the samples we have have almost all ancestry of this type. They then mix with the hunter-gatherer uh, a little bit. About 20% of the farmer of the ancestry of European farmers that we sampled by about, uh, uh, about 5,000 years ago is of this hunter-gatherer type. And then suddenly, beginning 4,500 years ago, this new green type of ancestry appears, which contains within it this ancient North Eurasian ancestry related to Native Americans. It's now the single largest component of Northern European populations today, and it stays after the arrival of this population. Um, and it comes in very clearly now because we have genetic data from them from the East, from steppe populations. The last part of this science part of my talk, I wanted to talk about one example of the impact of this movement. Um, and it's associated with what happened in the Western Europe and how this DNA coming in from the steppe and from the East, which came into Central Europe, Germany, for example, beginning about 4,500 years ago, how it got to Britain. So um, in Western Europe, there's a phenomenon called the uh, beaker phenomenon or the bell beaker culture associated with these very characteristic spot pots probably starts in Iberia, although this is debated, beginning around 4,800 uh, years ago and spreads throughout Central and then Western Europe into Britain by about 2,400 years ago. Um, and uh, it's associated with a set of funerary goods and different styles spreading over time. A question that archaeologists have always had is whether this is a spread of just cultural styles where people are imitating this type of way of making pots and particular set of traditions, um, or whether this is a movement of people carrying out this, uh, bringing these new cultures. So what we did is we expanded the sampling of beaker-associated individuals that existed prior to this work, which were all from, from Germany and the Czech Republic, to a much larger sampling right across the range of beakers across Western Europe, taking advantage of the large sample sizes that are now available. And also we sampled individuals, especially Britain, in Britain, both before and after the beaker phenomenon to see what happened. And what we saw immediately when we looked at the beaker individuals who are shown in color here is that they're not genetically homogeneous on this principal component analysis showing the ancestry components of West Eurasians. The ones from Iberia are genetically very different from the ones in Central Europe. And in fact, we can show that they didn't contribute at all to them. So the spread of this phenomenon seems to have nothing to do with the um, movement of people initially from Iberia to Central Europe or perhaps in the other direction. It's just a cultural communication of ideas, people copying each other somehow. So that's an amazing result and is different from the results of the genetics earlier where the corded ware complex in Eastern Europe really seems to come in from the steppe in a one-to-one -one correspondence or nearly one-to-one -one correspondence with people. That's a case of genetics following cultural change and here is a case of that not happening, showing the complexity of this. But what's very interesting is that in Britain, when the beakers arrive, which is between about 4,400 and 4,300 years ago, it's accompanied by movements of people. Prior to the arrival of the beaker uh, in Britain, people here cluster with early European farmers. Afterwards, they cluster here. And it's at least a 90% replacement of the population, and it's permanent because people in Britain look like these beaker individuals, and the Bronze Age pop groups following them are just like genetically the beaker individuals, either because they're directly derived from them or due to continuing flow from the continent. So this is an amazing level of replacement, and the people who, for example, first built Stonehenge, which is this iconic monument of southern Britain, um, which was built at the time by these, first farm, by these farmers of Britain, the large stones of Stonehenge were built by them. It's then taken over by beaker individuals who genetically we now know are almost completely unrelated to them, and yet it's continued to be built by them. So you can actually see in terms of proportions of ancestry, the first farmers are this blue type, almost it's almost gone by the Beaker period, and there's some resurfacing by the Middle Bronze Age, perhaps due to pockets of individuals from these farmers who then mix back in. 
<clears throat> so I wanted to conclude by talking for, uh, about opportunities for ancient DNA research in Israel. This will be very short. Um, I'm just going to talk about a number of projects that we've been involved in. We have a collaboration with Danny Nadel and colleagues that's already been published, um, where we were able to succeed at getting DNA from uh, Natufians, uh, hunter-gatherers prior to farming in this part of the world in the Carmel Ridge. Um, and this was really so exciting to actually be able to test whether this population was related to pre-pottery Neolithic farmers and later groups, which it is, although there's dis differences too, but it's just one site, so it would be very powerful to obtain data from additional sites to see if the group was homogeneous, this culture is genetically homogeneous, or not, like the beakers are, and also to study material from earlier periods, which should now be practical with the technology. Um, we have a collaboration with Edwin Vanderbrink, Yossi Nagar, and colleagues um, with, uh, from the site of Tel Shadud. There's an Egyptian sarcophagus uh, from about 1300 BCE uh, that contains within it an individual who is genetically very like the individual who's not buried in the Egyptian-related sar sarcophagus, suggesting that perhaps that cultural difference is not associated with a very different type of ancestry. We're working with Israel Finkelstein and colleagues, um, and uh, Liron Carmel and Egal Arel and colleagues uh, on DNA from Megiddo, um, which is already clear, has genetic ancestry from the east, from these Iranian-related populations that's distinct from the early, uh, farm, uh, the early farmers of the region, as well as ancestry from them as well, and it's very interesting to understand when this came in. And I'm going to go in a little bit more detail in a collaboration with Israel Hershkovitz, Hilame, and colleagues on DNA from a site called Pekein, which is a Copper Age site from northern Israel where we got absolutely amazing data. So we now have high quality data from 22 individuals, which more than doubles the literature of, in terms of sample size from the ancient Near East. And it's very high quality data. It's associated with very particular ossuaries in this cave um, and a very large number of individuals. These individuals have 60% approximately ancestry from people related to first farmers of this region, about 20% 20 20 ancestry related to people of the Iranian Copper Age, although not necessarily coming from Iran, but people related to them, and 20% ancestry related to people of Anatolia, from, but not necessarily coming from Anatolia, but people related to them. And that's different from the earlier preceding populations. But the later Bronze Age Levantine individuals we have data from, for example, from Tel Shadud and also from Jordan, from the site of Ein Ghazal, do not have the Anatolian Neolithic related ancestry. So if this Pekein population had contributed substantially to later groups, they would have, which means that this population was a dead end. It was a population that appeared at this time, but then went extinct or contributed minimally to later groups. This is very interesting because one of the things that ancient DNA allows you to see is extinct populations or groups that contributed minimally to later groups. Of course, we only have data from one site and being able to understand the homogeneity of the Copper Age population in the region and the extent to which it contributed is very interesting. So the summary is that the ancient DNA revolution is analogous to the radiocarbon revolution of 1949 when people first began to be able to get absolute dates from uh, organic material from ancient remains. It was an incredible discovery because it made it possible to establish chronology for ancient archaeological sites. And this was followed by a whole series of datings which allowed people to understand what came before what, what the time scale was, and it's been fully integrated by, into, by archaeologists into their understanding of ancient cultures. And I think that archaeologists are scientists. They are going to integrate this technology too, which allows access to an equally important type of information, which is how people are related to each other. It will tell you whether people from one site are related to people from another site, to how they're pe related to people today. And it will allow you to trace movements of people which provide possible vectors for cultural movements. It doesn't necessarily set mean that cultures spread along these vectors, but it means that there was connection, and then you could actually ask, establish more or less plausible movements. And I finally wanted to give a personal reflection, and I'm just going to read a statement um, about, about a personal reflection about, about this. So I'm going to look down at my computer. Um, while I do this. So um, I've spent a lot of time in Israel personally. The first time I came here was when I was seven years old. And we stayed that summer and the next in Jerusalem in an apartment um, that my father, grandfather owned in Mea Sharim, which, as many of you know, is an ultra-religious neighborhood in, in Jerusalem. Um, and um, one of the things that happened in those summers is that uh, every Friday afternoon before the Sabbath, 
uh, the, bo the boys were dismissed early they, from the yeshivas they went to. Normally they spent all day there, but they were dismissed early before the Sabbath. And they were often joining political demonstrations at the time. Um, during the protest, they would set fire to the dumpsters, and there was fights between the policemen and the um, boys. Um, they were about the excavations in the city of David, um, which, as you know, is south of the old city, and it covers much of the area that became the capital of Judea. Uh, after around 3,000 years ago, and they were distressed that the excavations would disturb ancient Jewish graves, which is a constant possibility when dis digging here. Um, so um, one thing that this has made me think about a lot is what would those protesters think of what my lab is doing now, grinding through the bones of all these ancient people, hundreds and hundreds a month. And perhaps they wouldn't care so much about the work outside of Israel. Um, but I think the fundamental ethical issue is much more general. And whether they're from Israel or not, it doesn't, I don't care. I think the important issue is to think about the ethical issues associated with the opening of graves and the sampling of remains from any ancient human, including people who almost certainly would not have wanted their bones to be sampled without giving it full thought, including, for example, ancient Egyptians, who certainly would not have wanted their bones to be disturbed, as you can tell from the culture, which is very focused on these ancient graves. I think that one argument that some ancient DNA specialists and archaeologists have made is that most of the skeletons we're studying are from cultures that are so remote in time that they have no traceable connections to peoples of the present. This is the view that's encoded in the North American Graves Repatriation Act in the United States, which governs how Native American remains should be returned or not returned to Native American populations. Um, and that is a uh, focuses on whether there's an established uh, cultural or biological connections to present day people. Um, but even this view is now breaking down. And I actually think that you really should think about these people, even the ones who don't have a cultural connection to the past as real people, and not really, I, I don't personally find that that is the key connection. So um, I'm not religious, but in 2016, I decided to ask a rabbi about this, um, who in this case is my mother's brother. Um, so he. Uh, is religious, but I had hoped he might be open to this question as he's been an advocate of adopting Orthodox Judaism um, as much as possible to the modern world while abiding by the constraints of its fixed rule. Um, he's been involved in establishing Open Orthodoxy, a movement called Open Orthodoxy. So I told him in that my lab, we were grinding through the bones of lots of ancient peoples, uh, many of whom may not have wanted their remains to be disturbed, and that I felt that we had not thought enough about this. And he was obviously troubled and asked for some time to think. And he afterward came back with his view, um, and often rabbis give a view and asked about something like this to provide guidance when there's no precedent. And he said that in his view, all human graves are sacrosanct, uh, whether Jewish or non-Jewish, but there are mitigating circumstances that perhaps make it permissible to open graves as long as there's potential to promote understanding and to break down barriers between people. Um, I think that this is something that is beginning to happen or is already happening with ancient DNA with, for example, its demonstration that the racial structure of the world is very different now than it used to be. And I think you really can't continue to be a racist if you really listen to these data. I think the study of human variation has not always been a force for good. Um, in Nazi Germany, someone with my expertise at interpreting genetic data who is not a Jew like I am would have been tasked with categorizing people by ancestry in the way that the pseudoscience at the time could not. But the moral value of research is defined by its social context. And I think in our time, the scientific study of our past has been a force, a force to explode stereotypes and racism. I'm optimistic that the direction of this work is to promote understanding. And I welcome the opportunity to do my best by the people um, that I've been given the privilege to study. And I see it as my role to midwife this field into one that is not just the province of geneticists, but also that can serve archaeologists and the public and public of the understanding of the past and who we are.